everybody can everyone hear and see me can you give me a yes can you give me a yes if you can hear and see me please do let me know i've been having a lot of technical difficulties having a slight meltdown over Streamyard's not working so if you can hear and see me guys please just give me a yes give me a yes i just need to know yes you can yes you can hear and see me fantastic fantastic okie dokies fantastic guys are you excited for an mep session this this evening give me a yes give me a yes and first of all welcome 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 guys to another free uh pre-read shortcuts uh free webinar series um so today we're going to be focusing on mep we're going to focus on mep so today there will be um, some questions, there'll be some answers, GBHC style questions. Um, some questions have come from our new uh, question bank. Um, and we're going to dive into a couple of topics so you can get a real good taster of essentially what of our MEP course is all about. So guys, if you are excited, give me a yes, give me a yes. I won't be, what I'm going to do is that because I had technical problems, I'm going to be on my phone and my laptop at the same time because I'm going to have to um, StreamYard wouldn't let me upload my slides. I had a little meltdown over it. So I have to share my screen. That means I won't see your comments, but if I go on my phone, I will be able to see your comments. So I'll be able to address it, but I won't be able to pop up your comment like I usually do. Okay. Does that sound all good in the hood, guys? Give me a yes. Give me a yes if that sounds good in the hood, guys. Okay, so I just need to sort this out. Just give me one second to get it all nice and looking pretty for you. Okay, so guys, can you see this screen? Can you see this screen? Give me a yes, give me a yes, because today is going to be medicines, ethics and practice. We're just going to dive into some topics, very common areas, essentially, which you can, um, which come up into the GBHC registration assessment. Okay, so I do apologize for the late starting, okay, but I will certainly make that up to you guys, okay? So let's get this webinar kicking off, guys, okay? We know that pharmacy law is boring, okay? How many of you go, how many of you try and look into the MEP when you was at university and you're in, in, and you're in a pharmacy law lecture? How many of you, how many of you actually find pharmacy law boring? Yes, we're getting lots of yeses. We're getting lots of yeses come through. Sana says yes. Okay, so hopefully in this MEP session, you're not going to be bored to death, okay? So there's going to be lots of case studies. And of course, if you guys know about what I'm like in the MEP and OTC courses and how I use my fiance, Mr. Goho, of course, is going to return. So we'll have case studies of the one and only famous Mr. Gohill, okay? So... One thing that's really important to say to you guys is that the GBHC does not expect you to be a lawyer, okay? You are not going to be required to memorize regulation numbers, okay? What you are going to be expected to do in the registration assessment is to actually be able to apply law in a situation in which you may encounter in the pharmacy, okay, in your day-to-day -day clinical practice, okay? So, quiz time guys it is quiz time okay are you ready give me a yes if you are ready for a quiz and don't forget guys do not forget that one of you if you stay to the end one of you will be the one of the lucky winners to win a one week free trial on our standard program fantastic we're getting lots of yeses lots of yeses amazing 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 okay what I will have to tell you is that if you don't know the answer to the questions, don't worry. We have undergraduates here. We have trainee pharmacists here. Everyone has different strengths and weaknesses, okay? We're all in a different place in terms of our revision, and we will all learn together, okay? Fantastic. Okay, so guys, are you ready for your first question? Give me a one. Give me a one for question number one, guys. Give me a one. Give me a one if you are ready for question number one. 
Yes, fantastic. Lots of ones coming through. Alexandra says one. Tom says one. Sarah says one. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Normal rules will apply, guys. It's just going to be one minute um, for the question. Pop your answers down and we can discuss through the question and, and essentially go through why that answer is correct. And we're going to link it to some MEP topics as well. Okay, guys. So, guys, here is your first question. Okay, fantastic, guys. Fantastic, fantastic. We're getting lots of answers through already. Fantastic. Sarah says A. Al says A. Sana says A. Alexandra says A. Fantastic. Okay, we're getting some E's. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Okay, so essentially, Regulation 200, the question is, Regulation 217 of the Human Medicines Regulations sets out general prescription requirements for the supply of prescription-only medicines. And which one is not going to be a general prescription requirement? And fantastic, guys, all of you which have selected A is correct. Fantastic, okay? So, of course, prescriptions do need to be written in indelible ink. Indelible ink can either mean computer-generated or it could be literally written in pen, okay? Because, of course, why we ha it has been in indelible ink. So, if you came across a prescription and it was written in pencil, what could the potential concern be? Okay, not of course, of course, it's going to be illegal, but why would it not be acceptable to have a prescription written in pencil? Okay, so fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. You can rub it off. It can be modified. Fantastic. That is why the law is there. Fantastic. Okay, otherwise we're all going to be changed. Yeah, it can be manipulated. Yeah, fantastic. Well done. Well done, guys. Okay, so Tom says, unless it's an EPS signature. Okay, so if you're really going to delve into the human medicines regulations, I believe, if I remember the regulation correctly, it's regulation 219 of the human medicines regulations, which in addition to the law, which kind of like gives you an update about essentially the signature in relation to electronic prescriptions. Um, and essentially the way that the electronic prescription signatures work is that it's a unique identifiable code to that prescriber via that person's smart card. Okay, so... Carbon copies of NHS prescriptions, okay? These are actually perfectly legal as long as they're going to be signed in ink, okay? Something that you don't necessarily come across very often now, okay? Um, sometimes you may get, sometimes you may see them in some hospital departments, okay? You can get carbon copies of NHS prescriptions, but you rarely see them now, okay? But just so you know, fun fact for you, carbon copies of prescriptions are acceptable as long as they are signed in ink, okay? Fantastic, guys. So. You guys absolutely smashed that question. But what are the legal requirements of a prescription? OK, pop them down into the chat, guys. Pop it down into the chat. Give you just burst out anything that you can think of. What are the legal requirements for prescriptions? OK, this is covered in the human medicines regulations. And of course, the rules are going to be the same for both NHS and private prescriptions, guys. OK. If you can just think of any other, yes, fantastic. We get a name and address of the patient, date of the prescription, fantastic, okay. Name and address of the patient, okay. <clears throat> okay, you've got patient name, we've got, Tom says patient name, date of birth, age of under 12, no fixed abode is legally acceptable, fantastic. Okay, so 
Okay, yeah, you need to age if under 12, fantastic, fantastic. So how I generally remember it, guys, okay? You know I like my acronyms, I like my mnemonics, I like my Mr. Go Hill case studies, okay? So I remember my legal um, requirements or prescriptions via PADS, okay? <coughs> so you can think about this like a prescription PADS, okay? P is going to stand for patient name, okay? Patient name and address. And it's also going to stand for prescriber particulars and address. So when we're talking about particulars, okay, when I'm talking about prescriber particulars, what could that potentially mean? What is what is a prescriber particular? It's a very common question that I get asked in my webinars. So in the essentially my mnemonic, I'm saying it's prescriber particulars and address. What do I mean by that? Yeah, fantastic. Alex Arch says they're regulatory body. Fantastic. It needs to, the prescriber particulars needs to have something. You need to have details which state what type of prescriber is actually going, is prescribing this, is, is actually prescribing this prescription to a patient. So this could be either through um, their registration number. It could be a GMC number. It could be an F code from the hospital because um, you often see on NHS prescriptions, you don't always see the GMC number. It could be the F code from the doctor. Um, it could be a GBHC registration number, but it's a pharmacist independent prescriber. And it's really important that we have the prescriber particulars because not every professional can prescribe. So guys, can you, for example, can a chiropractor be an appropriate practitioner to write prescriptions? Does anybody know, can a chiropractor write prescriptions? If you don't know, just guess. Give me a yes or a no. Let's gamble. It's okay if you don't know. If you just give a guess. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. We're getting quite a few no's through. Fantastic. A chiropractor is not actually listed being an appropriate practitioner to prescribe medicines. Okay. So if you want more details about that, it's actually listed under Regulation 214 of the Human Medicines Regulations 2012. Of course, age of under 12, that's a legal requirement. Date, why is the date important? Why is the date important for our prescription, guys? I'm just doing some nice active recall here for you guys just to consolidate your no law knowledge. Yeah, fantastic, you're saying about validity. Yeah, to make sure it's valid, okay? Could be a prescription from 10 years ago. Oh, trust me, I had an owing slip hadn't handed to me eight years ago. And um, it was like, so I hadn't, when I was when I was working in the, I was a pharmacist manager and I had this lady come in, it was an owing slip and I thought, I don't recognize this at all. And then it was the owing slip was like eight years ago. It was eight years old. And then they were shouting at me saying that they want me to fill the owing. I was like, no, I'm really sorry, it's expired. Like, <laughs> so fantastic. Okay, so we're getting non-CD valid for six months, okay, unless it's isotretinoin seven days, CD is valid for 28 days, but is it every control drug? Is it every control drug that has a validity for 28 days, guys? So, for example, does Schedule 5 control drugs have a validity of 28 days, okay? Yeah, fantastic. Santa is saying prescription is valid for six months. Fantastic. For Schedule 5 CDs, they're valid for six months. Okay, fantastic. And of course, we're going to need the signature of that prescriber. Amazing, amazing. Okay, you're absolutely smashing this. So guys, if you are a visual, if you are a visual learner, give me a yes, give me a yes. Here is a nice visual diagram just to help you to visualize those legal requirements on a prescription okay and of course one thing that i did forget to mention no fixed abode is the minimum legal requirement for the details for the address okay so here is your little visual diagram here you can have a, if you're watching on the replay you can pause it or you can take a screenshot and take notes from this as well guys okay but how many of you are a table revision people how many of you like a revision table give me a yes give me a yes if you like a revision table because of course for every visual diagram that i do i always i always 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 do a revision table 
Okay, fantastic. We're getting some getting some table peeps in the house. Anyone else a table peep, guys? Because here is your nice revision table here for you as well, going through all the legal requirements for a prescription for both NHS and private prescriptions. Okay, fantastic. Guys, are you ready for your next question? The next question is going to be touching onto the controlled drugs, okay? And we can go into a little bit more detail about controlled drugs as well. So give me a yes, give me a yes. If you are ready for question number two, guys, give me a yes or give me a number two if you are ready for the next question. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I've had a comment to say that the image isn't clear. Can everyone else see the image clearly? If you're on your phone, it doesn't always come up clearly. It's always better to be on like on the tablet or a computer. That was just what I found from my own personal experience. Okay, fantastic. We get some yeses and twos. Here is your next question, guys. Okay, fantastic, guys. We're getting lots of answers through already. You guys are smashing this. You guys are absolutely smashing this. Amazing. So we're getting some bees. We're getting lots of bees in the house. Fantastic. Tom Jackson says, B, 28 days after in capital. Damn, yes. Well done. Well done. Random says, B. Fuzzy says, B. Fantastic. Alexandra says B. Al says B. Fantastic. Amazing, guys. Well done. Well done. Okay. So the correct answer here is going to be B. So essentially, if you have your prescription dated on the 1st of January 2024, okay, of course, it's going to be 28 day validity, but after the appropriate date on that prescription. So therefore, that means the last that you can dispense that prescription is going to be the 29th of January. And therefore, on the 30th, it would be expired and you cannot supply it to to the patient. Okay, fantastic. Amazing, guys. Okay, so let's touch on a little bit of controlled drugs. Let's talk about a little bit of extra about controlled drug legal requirements on their prescriptions. Okay, so we've touched on the basis of the legal requirements of a prescription. So for example, your POMs and your P's and even the odd GSL that can be on your prescriptions. Okay, but what are the additional legal requirements for controlled drugs, guys. If you can name some, throw them in the chat, throw them in the chat. Let's get this active recall going. Active recall, definitely, definitely they will benefit you for your exams, whether you're at university or revising for the registration assessment, guys. So of course, we've already spoken about the dates in terms of schedule of controlled drugs. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, we're getting comments of total quantity must be written in words and figures. Fantastic. Quantity written in words and figures. Amazing. Fantastic. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Is there anything else that you can think of, guys? Directions. That is so important. Okay, we will cover that as well. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. It is a 28 day validity for schedule two, three, and four. Fantastic. Dental use for use of dental surgeons only. Name of CD, formulation, strength, dose. You guys are killing this. You're absolutely smashing it. Well done. Absolutely smashing it. Okay. So, so essentially, of course, we're going to need the patient name and address. Okay. The quantity. Okay. The total quantity needs to be written in words and figures. Okay. Let's throw out another question there for you guys. Let's say, for example, I had a prescription for, I don't know, Severodol 10 milligram tablets, okay? I needed 60 tablets, but it was only written in words, but not figures, okay? What can we do? Do we send this prescription back to the prescriber or can we do something else?
Yes, fantastic. If one is missing, you can add it, but you sign and date it. Fantastic. This is actually called the technical amendments, okay, under the misuse of drugs regulations. Fantastic. You can amend and dispense. Fantastic. You can amend it, but you must sign it, you must date it, okay, and you must print your name and pop your GPHC number underneath it, okay. Fantastic. Smashing it, guys. Well done. Okay. So, it is not a legal requirement, okay? It is not a legal requirement, okay? But it is good practice to ensure that no more than 30 days supply is prescribed at any one point, okay? So if you have a prescription, let's say, for example, methylphenidate, um, prolonged release capsules, the dose is one in the morning, but you have a quantity of 90 capsules in total, it's not illegal, it's just not the best practice. And often you will find that a three month supply is often um, prescribed for patients with ADHD because essentially it can be very hard to get those appointments in the NHS. So it's very often that you will see those prescriptions to be given in three month in the quantity of a three month interval. OK, so it's not a legal requirement. It's just professional not to supply any more than not to prescribe any more than a 30 day supply. Of course, you guys have already smashed it. So if a dentist is prescribing it, if a dentist is prescribing a controlled drug, OK, it needs to have the words of dental treatment um, only. OK, um, if it's an installment prescription, OK, the directions, OK, you need to have very particular directions for installment prescriptions, and that's going to be a legal requirement. So let's throw out another MEP question out there for you guys. OK, so if we have an installment prescription for methadone, what type of prescription form would you expect that to be on? Yes, it's going to be a blue prescription. Fantastic. Well done. Well done. It's going to be a blue script and it's going to be an FP10 MDA. Fantastic. OK, when the MDA literally just stands for Misuse of Drugs Act. OK, fantastic. OK, so we spoke about total quantity written in words and figures. We spoke about the dates. OK, so the validity of prescriptions is going to be 28 days after the appropriate date for Schedule 2, 3 and 4 CDs, Schedule 5 CDs, six months. OK, of course, we're going to need the address of the prescriber. OK, and some of you guys have already mentioned, OK, about dose that needs to be a suitable legal dose. OK, but we'll cover that in one second. I'm going to ask you some questions about that in a moment. OK, of course, the form needs to be stated. OK, if there's more than one form of it, so like capsules, tablets, liquid, it needs to be stated. Same with the strength. Let's say, for example, Zomorph. OK, having a prescription for Zomorph capsules isn't really appropriate because you need to say, well, Zomorph comes as 10 milligram, 30 milligram, 60 milligram, 100 milligram. So that strength needs to be stated. OK, so if you guys are a table revision person, because I'm a table person, you can take a screenshot of this and essentially you can make some notes on this as well, guys. OK, does that make sense so far about um, about legal requirements on prescriptions, guys? Give me a yes if that makes sense so far. Yes, amazing, amazing. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, so guys, we were just talking about legally accepted doses on the controlled drug prescription. But what is what is a legally acceptable dose on a controlled drug prescription? What does that mean? Because we need to apply this to practice so we can remember, we can memorise the law to say that the dose needs to be an illegally acceptable dose, but we need to understand what that actually means. OK, so fantastic. We're getting comments like one as directed. OK, so if I let's I'm going to put a hypothetical situation. OK, hypothetical situation. If we had a prescription that said um it was for zomorph 10 milligram capsules and it said um to take twice a day as directed okay would would that be a legally acceptable dose okay fantastic it wouldn't be a legally acceptable dose okay so 
in order to be classified as a legally accepted dose, you need to have some form of quantity within the direction. So for example, take one twice a day, okay? Even if you had take one when required, that is classed as a legally accepted dose, okay? Does that make sense, guys? It needs to say how many of the tablets or capsules or how many milliliters of a liquid needs to be taken at that frequency. Okay, does that all make sense, guys? So other examples of legally accepted doses, it could be um, one, like, you know, take one as directed or take two when required or take one when or take one PRN, for example. Um, or one to or take one to two capsules when required. Can I explain again? Yes, of course. Okay. So in order for a dose to be legally accepted, okay, to be a legally acceptable dose under the Misuse of Drugs Regulations 2001, the dose needs to have some form of quantity in it. So it needs to, in the directions, it needs to say, well, how many capsules or how many tablets or how many meals for example does the patient need to take so if you had the dosage of take twice a day that wouldn't be legally acceptable because it's not telling you well how many does the patient need to take twice a day does that make sense now Okay. If that now makes sense, can you just give me a yes or a thumbs up, thumbs up guys? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, smashing. Okay. I think I'm getting a bit of an internet lag because I keep refreshing YouTube to see your comments because I was of the technical problems I'm having. Okay. So abbreviations are actually fine. So if you had like um, a take one cap BD, perfectly fine. Okay, so, right, shall we move on to our next question, guys? Give me a free, give me a free, if you are ready to move on to the next question, guys. Give me a free, give me a free. Okay, fantastic, we're getting lots of freeze come through, lots of freeze, lots of freeze. Okay, awesome, okay. Here is your next question, guys. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. We're getting some answers through already, guys. We're getting some answers through. Fantastic. Okay, so we're getting some C C C C C C Cs. Okay, awesome, amazing, amazing. Okay, so well done, guys. For all of you who have put C, you are correct. You are correct. You are correct. Fantastic. Okay, so pharmacists can actually provide an advanced supply of emergency hormonal contraception in the case of contraceptive failure okay so you as a pharmacist you are perfectly allowed to do this as long as you um actually do your clinical assessment and you are happy that the patient is competent about how to take this medication okay so moving on to talking about the second option L1 can actually be sold to those under the age of 16. The product license of L1 actually states it can be for any woman of a childbearing potential. Okay, but of course, 
essentially for anyone under the age of 16, what do you need to apply? There's a particular guideline that you need to apply, certain guidelines that you need to apply, guys. Tell me what they are, guys. Pop your answers into the comments. What are the guidelines that you need to apply if someone is under the age of 16 and they request emergency hormonal contraception in the pharmacy? Fraser, we're getting Fraser, Fraser's, Fraser's. Fantastic, you guys have absolutely smashed it. Well done, well done. Okay, so looking at option D here, okay? Going into option D, okay, we've already discussed the age, okay? Okay, but within four days of unprotected sexual intercourse, okay? Is that correct? How many days, is it four days? Is it a different amount of days for L1? Yes, it's fantastic. It's five days. It's going to be five days. Yeah, well done. You're telling me, Georgina, don't be so silly. It's going to be five days. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And what strengths are going to be available over the counter? It's not five milligrams. What strength is L1, guys? So L1 does contain ulipristal acetate, okay? Yeah, fantastic, 30 milligrams, smashing, okay. You're finding this way too easy, guys. This is awesome, you're actually smashing it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, guys, are you ready for your next question? Question number four of the evening, question number four. Give me a four if you are ready for question number four. Yeah, it's fantastic. We're getting lots of falls through, lots of falls, lots of falls. Awesome. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so here is your next question, guys. Okay, we're getting some answers through already. I'll give you another about 30 seconds just so we can get some more answers through, guys. It might just be my internet lagging because I haven't I've been having quite a lot of technical problems this evening. Fantastic. We're getting lots of C's, lots of C's in the house, lots of C's, lots of C's. Okay, amazing, amazing. Okay, awesome guys. Okay, so if you put the option C, you are correct. Okay, so, okay. So essentially, you're teaching pharmacy students about repeatable private prescriptions and you have to identify which of the following is incorrect regarding repeatable private prescriptions, okay? So the incorrect option is, of course, going to be that Schedule 3 and Schedule 4 controlled drugs are repeatable on private prescriptions, okay? So why is this not true, okay? So... Why is this not true? We thought, so Schedule 4 controlled drugs, can they be repeated? Or is it just Schedule 3? Okay. Fantastic. We're getting scheduled two and schedule three are not repeatable. Fantastic. Well done. Well done. Well done. You guys are smashing it. Schedule four can be repeated, but not schedule three. Fantastic. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Well done. So <coughs> let's talk about, let's talk about in terms of private prescriptions. Okay. Have you guys ever seen a repeatable private prescription in your, in the, in your pharmacy? Give me a yes. If you have seen it guys, give me a yes. If you have seen private repeatable prescriptions. Okay. 
Yes, you have. Mana says, yes. Okay, amazing, amazing. Okay, yes. Okay, they're, qu they're quite common. Okay, yes, we're getting lots of yeses through. Wow, damn. Okay, so essentially, of course, we need to ensure that our, our regular legal requirements for prescriptions are going to be met. And essentially, a repeatable private prescription, in most cases, it just looks exactly the same as a regular private prescription, but it's going to have a statement of repeat on there. And so, for example, okay, if it says repeat three times, what you have to do is that you dispense it, but you can repeat it three times and therefore that's going to be a total of four dispensings, okay, to that patient, okay? Does that make sense, guys? <clears throat> With the exception of contraception, okay? So contraception can be repeated five times, therefore dispensed within, dispensed six times within a period of six months. Okay, fantastic, it's all making sense so far. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, so what happens when the number of repeats is not stated on the prescription? So let's say, for example, we have a private prescription for naproxen, um, it can be naproxen 500 milligram tablets, um, and the dose is going to be take one tablet twice a day with meals, and it just says repeat on there. Okay, how many times can you actually dispense this? OK, and the answer is, is that if it just says the word repeat, OK, and doesn't indicate how many times that you repeat it, you dispense it, you dispense it the once, OK, then you repeat it the once, OK? So therefore, the total amount of dispensing is just going to be two times that you dispense it to the patient, the original dispensing and then the repeat. OK, fantastic. You're all saying dispense twice. Amazing. You're smashing it. Well done, guys. OK. We've just discussed this about how Schedule 2 and Schedule 3 controlled drugs are absolutely no way Jose are allowed on a repeatable private prescription. OK, so Schedule 4, um, Schedule 4 controlled drugs, they can be on the private repeat prescription. However, the first dispensing must be within that 28 day period from the date of the prescription. After that, there is no time frame afterwards, and that is down to your professional and clinical judgment as a pharmacist. Okay, and the same, the same applies to other prescriptions, so like your other POMs and Schedule 5 controlled drugs. Your first dispensing must be completed within six months from the date of the prescription, and then there is going to be no time frame afterwards, but once again, that is going to be down to your clinical judgment and your professional judgment as a pharmacist. OK, so let's say, for example, this patient has an let's say, for example, it's been a 12 month gap or a six month gap. OK, you will be questioning to yourself that this isn't necessarily suitable for the patient to be having since they've been so long without the medication. OK. So how long do we need to keep the prescriptions in the pharmacy? You need to keep private repeat prescriptions two years after the last repeat. OK, so let's say, for example, Mr. Gohill walks into your pharmacy. He has a private repeat prescription. He hands it to you and it has repeat five times. OK, and this is only the second dispensing. OK, do you give that prescription back to the patient or do you keep hold of it within the pharmacy? Fantastic. You're saying it, give it back. Yes, fantastic. So private repeatable prescriptions, you can hand it back to the patient. You only need to keep it in the pharmacy for two years after the last repeat. OK, you can give it back. You don't you don't have to keep it in the pharmacy. Most patients would want you to keep it at the pharmacy so they don't lose it. OK, uh, but essentially, if the patient asks for the prescription back, you can give it back to them. OK, so you only give it back. You only keep it. You only keep it after the last repeat has been completed. OK, does that make sense, guys, about private repeatable prescriptions? OK. 
Okay, give me a yes, guys, if that makes sense. And then we can go on to our last question of the evening. And then we've got some case studies. And then, of course, guys, don't forget about our raffle at the end where one of you will be a potential lucky winner to win a one-week trial of our standard program. Fantastic. We're getting lots of yeses through, lots of yeses. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Here is your last question. We can then go on to case studies, then raffle. Okay, guys, we're getting some answers through already. We're getting some answers through. What answers do we have for this, guys? What answers? What answers? What answers? Okay, fantastic. We're getting lots of Ds, lots of Ds, lots of Ds, lots of Ds, lots of Ds. Okay, amazing, amazing. Okay, you're all telling me D, okay? But why? Why? I've seen this on dispensing labels, okay? And I go in the pit, go into the pharmacy and I pick up my Clexane or I pick up, obviously, um, my eye drops or whatever. I see keep out of reach and sight of children on my dispensing label. Are you sure it's not a legal requirement? Ah, there you go. Alexandra saying it's good practice. Yeah, fantastic. RPS recommendation. You guys are killing it. Well done, guys. It is a RPS recommendation, okay? So, it's not going to be a normal MEP. It won't be a normal MEP webinar if I haven't got Mr. Go Hill returns. Here is my little cartoon character with my fiance. Okay, and just so everyone is absolutely clear, he has my he has given me his complete consent to give him every single case study and every single theoretical disease under the earth for educational purposes. Okay, <laughs> so guys. Mr. Gohill returns, okay? Mr. Gohill is studying pharmacy and wants to understand the legal labeling requirements for dispensing labels, okay? Looking at this label here, okay? Can you identify the legal label requirements on this label, on this dispensing label for the proxim 500 milligrams, okay? Can you identify the legal labeling requirements? Okay, if you're not too sure, hazard a guess, hazard a guess is all about applying the information that we have learned and putting it in, it's all about applying that information. Okay, fantastic. We're getting patient name, we're getting some quantities. Okay, fantastic. Okay, we're getting patient name, drug name, dispensing date, date of dispensing, drug name. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Yes, precautions. You guys are killing it. You guys are killing it. Okay, pharmacy name and address. We must have the pharmacy name and address. Okay, fun facts. Quantity is not actually a legal requirement. Okay, so here are your legal labeling requirements. Okay, so I've just highlighted it all there for you. So of course, we'll have patient name, we'll have the pharmacy address, um, pharmacy name and address, date of dispensing. Uh, name of the medicine, directions and any precautions. Okay, so that's a good, that's a bit of a good visual guide for you guys. But of course, if you like a table and like a revision table, here is your revision table. Okay, so patient name, name and address of supply and pharmacy, date of pharmacy, name of the medicine, directions of use. Okay, and of course, any precautions relating to the use of the medicine. OK, and of course, you guys have absolutely, absolutely smashed it out of the park where in that question you identified that keep out of reach and sight of children is an RPS recommendation. And the same goes for use this medicine only on your skin where applicable. OK, is that nice and clear for you guys as well about legal labeling requirements?
okay so give me a yes if that makes sense guys amazing if that all makes sense guys just give me a yes give me a yes because of course we're going to have another case study mr go hill was going to return again okay we're getting yes 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 okay fantastic okay guys amazing amazing so last case study of the evening before the raffle okay guys so mr go hill returns okay mr go hill comes to your pharmacy requesting some help he has been going through his medicine drawers and he found some metoclopramide 10 milligram tablets which was prescribed to him last year he wants to keep hold of these just in case he ever needs them in the future particularly if he spends too long in the pub again he wants to know when is the last day he can use this medicine so guys if the picture is not very clear the picture is a base of a metoclopramide packet and it has the expiry date of 12 24. so when is the last day that mr go hill can actually safely take the metoclopramide 10 milligram tablets expiry dates is a very common thing that comes up in the exam as well as legal requirements on prescriptions your cds expiry dates labeling requirements very common topic to come up fantastic don't use after the 31st of december 2024 fantastic so what is the difference between an expiry date and a use by date guys What is the difference, guys, between an expiry and a use-by date? Fantastic. Okay. Okay, well done, well done, guys. So, essentially, the difference between a use-by or a use-before versus an expiry date is that a use-by or a use-before basically means that you have to use it before the end of the previous month, okay? So let's say, for example, it was a use-by the 12th of, um, if it was, if they if the expired, I can't get my words out now, rewind that, okay? If the use by date was December 24, that means that you have to use it before the end of November. OK, an expiry day, as you guys correctly pointed out, is that it should not be used after the end of that month stated. OK, fantastic. Does that make sense, guys? Does that all make sense, guys? Give me a yes. Give me a yes. Getting some comments here that metoclopramide should not be taken more than five days. That is correct. That is correct. But sometimes metoclopramide can be prescribed long term, although not ideal for obvious reasons. Um, but it can be prescribed long term for some certain conditions. Um, consultants can prescribe it for, for a longer term period to take on a when required basis. Okay, so I'm getting lots of yeses. Does that all make sense, guys? It all makes sense. Okay, awesome, awesome. So how many MEP questions are there in the exam? Roughly, okay, so it's technically it's classed as a low-weighted topic. Um, I can never tell you exactly how many questions are going to be in the exam. It literally depends on the exam writers and, of course, um, I don't have any involvement in writing the GBHC registration assessment, but I can guarantee you that, that there will definitely be MEP questions in the exam because it's very important for the day-to-day -day running, as, as for the day-to-day -day practice of a pharmacist to understand pharmacy law and to be able to apply it in practice. Okay. So, guys, who loves a freebie? Give me a me. Give me a me if you love a freebie. If you love a freebie, give me a me. Give me a me because one of you will be a lucky winner to have the one week trial of our standard plan program. You get a me, 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 me. Okay, guys, I'm going to 
just so it's fair and you can see who I've picked, I am just going to minimise my screen quickly. Oh, if my computer wants to behave. Okay. Keep putting me, guys. Put me, me, me. Okay. And I will close my eyes and I click on the comment. Okay. I will click on the comment, guys. Okay. Give me a me. Give me a me. Okay. Let's get my cursor ready so I can scroll up and down. Okay, guys. Who's going to be the lucky winner of the one week trial of our standard program? And we have Patima. Congratulations! You have congratulations, you have won a one week trial of our standard program. So congratulations, congratulations. Okay, you would need to email um Uma at Prevo Shortcuts um Uma at Prevo Shortcuts um to tell him that essentially that you've won this. Um and then essentially we can sort it out from there. Fantastic. So congratulations, okay. Congratulations, congratulations. So, guys, okay. If you liked the taster, okay, if you like the taster of today's MEP session, okay, please check out our courses on our website. There is a full MEP course, okay, a full recorded MEP courses, including our standard and premium plans. And we have additional live webinars starting in February, okay. So, guys, I hope you've enjoyed the session, okay. Really hope you've enjoyed it. So, I apologize for the late running. I apologize for being a bit stressed about it, okay, because I went into a bit of a meltdown with technical problems. Um, or although I couldn't pop up all of your comments, okay, I hope I've actually delivered this to the standard that you expected. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Okay, I hope you found it very, very helpful. Okay, guys. So, Okay, you're very welcome for the revision session. It's our pleasure. Okay, it's our pleasure to do these webinars for you guys. Okay, and thank you very much for watching and thank you very, very much for joining and being engaging. And you're also clever, you're going to smash the exams. Okay, whether you're an undergraduate, you're going to smash your uni exams. If you're a trainee father, you're going to smash the GBHC registration assessment, guys. You are so clever. You smashed out those questions out of the park, guys, okay? So well done to all of you. Thank you for joining, okay? And I hope you have a lovely, lovely evening. And congratulations to Fatima, who has won our one-week um, trial of our standard program, okay? So fantastic, guys. I hope you all have a lovely evening, okay? And see you later, okay, from all of us at Pre-Red Shortcuts, okay? See you later, guys. Bye.